All right. Hey, everyone. Happy, what day is this? Happy Tuesday. I can never seem to remember what day it is. They're all Mondays to me. Um, so we're going to talk, talk about constrained language mode. So what is constrained language mode? Well, in past streams, we've talked ad nauseum about Windows Defender application control. And we've built policies, both kernel mode and user mode policies in the VM environment that I've been running here. And we got it to the point where we can safely run everything in enforcement mode. Now, the question is, uh, considering the policies allow for Windows sign code to run, PowerShell is Windows signed, it's included in box. And PowerShell being PowerShell allows you to do literally anything you want to do from like a user mode programming and automation perspective, right? Um, so that's a potential uh, danger if we're trying to enforce str strong uh, code integrity. So what PowerShell offers as a mitigation against breaking out of uh, otherwise strong code integrity enforcement is something called constrained language mode. The way that you go about enabling it is one of, well, there's, there's several ways, but the, the two uh, robust ways in which it would be enabled would be where you have either app locker or Windows Defender application control in enforcement mode. Now, considering the focus of previous streams has resolved, uh, revolved around Defender application control, that's what I have enforced currently um, on my system. And just as a refresher, um, one of the ways you can easily find out if you're actually in Defender Application Control Enforcement Mode is with the built-in Get Computer Info commandlet. So the, yeah, the last two properties here will indicate that um, not only Defender Application Control in general is in Enforcement Mode, but um, if you have a user mode code integrity policy as part of your Defender application control policy in enforcement mode, that will also be specified here. Cool. Um, so let's start digging into constrained language mode. First off, um, I believe there's a couple ways to validate that you, uh, the language mode that you're in. The one that I remember is this. So using the built-in host variable, it has a run space property, and that object has a language mode property, okay? Now, let's see what kind of object this thing is. Okay, so it's a PS language mode enum, which means that we should be able to pipe language mode to get member, and I wanna look at all of its static properties, okay? So it would appear that these are the four supported language modes. The default language mode when you don't have app locker or defender application control in enforcement mode is full language, meaning there are absolutely no restrictions imposed upon you in what you can do in PowerShell at all. And again, PowerShell being PowerShell, um, like I, I sometimes like to think of PowerShell as like effectively a debugger. Like you're given a rich set of APIs, namely access to the .NET framework that allows you to achieve arbitrary code execution and complete control over the memory space within PowerShell. Um, and so that, that would break our guarantee of having an otherwise 
strongly enforced code integrity policy. So let's learn a little bit more about what it is that constrained language mode does to attempt to prevent us from breaking out of its constraints and achieving arbitrary unsigned code execution. I think um, I'm pretty specific about specifying the attacker objective of arbitrary unsigned code execution because, well, as you just saw, like I ran this, right? Like I just ran PowerShell code, right? Constrained language mode doesn't aim to restrict the execution of code that is intended to be allowed to run. What it intends to do is prevent you from breaking out of the restrictions it imposes such that you can execute arbitrary unsigned code. All right. So let's dig into this a little bit more. First of all, there is a help topic on the subject. And I believe I'll just do a wildcard search here for language. Um, yeah, about language modes. Uh, if you're not aware, PowerShell has a ton of built-in help. Um, all of its built-in commandlets have help for the commandlets, but if there's like a more general, higher level topic, um, those will be defined in these uh, like text-based help files. And they'll all start with, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, about underscore. So language modes just happens to be one of those topics. So this indeed does confirm the four language modes that we saw. So let's um, scroll down to constrained language mode, which is the one that is the one that uh, pertains to app locker and defender application control enforcement. Right. So it's designed to support user mode code integrity, and that makes sense because. It only applies to PowerShell, and PowerShell only runs in user mode. Uh -huh. <laughs> wow, this, this could probably use some updating. So user mode code integrity on Windows RT. Uh, I would be shocked if anyone in the chat room, besides if, if James Forshaw happens to be here, if uh, any of you have actually used Windows RT on uh, the very first Surface tablet that came out. Um, if so, speak up because this is kind of a kind of an old relic now. But um, so disregard that. This applies to App Locker and Defender Application Control enforcement um, in PowerShell version five and above. Uh, <laughs> that's a kind of a crucial distinction here because uh, constrained language mode enforcement. If you happen to have PowerShell v two installed. Uh, is, is, is not a thing on PowerShell version 2. So uh, if you give the attacker the opportunity on a lockdown system to run PowerShell v2, none of the stuff matters. None of the, uh, the, there's no such thing as constrained language mode enforcement there. So um, please be aware of that vector. And in a high security environment where you're deploying Defender application control, please, hey James, <laughs> uh, please ensure that uh, PowerShell version two is not installed. All right. Yeah, this documentation even talks about ARM devices, which I, I guess might be like, might are kind of starting to be a thing again, but anyway, I digress. All right. So the features of constrained language mode are as follows. All commandlets in Windows modules and other user mode code integrity approved commandlets are fully functional and have complete access to system resources, except as noted. Um, so I'm gonna put my attacker hat on here and read between the, the lines there a little bit. So I would be curious to know what they define as a quote windows module okay um and other umci approved commandlets so um from like a reconnaissance perspective 
one thing that an attacker might be interested in doing is, well, one, validate that Defender Application Control is enforced, which you can find out with get-computer-info. If it is enforced, um, there are ways that we can recover the, um, the deployed uh, binary policies and convert them back to uh, XML. Um, I'll try to remember to cover that at some point later on, but I wrote a function that recovers all that uh, with a little bit, bit of help from, uh, from James Borshaw here. Um, cool, and have complete access to system resources. Um, I'm not really clear on what they meant by that. Um, so yeah, I can't really speak to that. Okay, all elements of the Windows PowerShell scripting language are permitted, right? So like you saw me do this earlier, right? Like um, we read, we called a property getter on this language mode property, right? So I was allowed to execute that code. I was allowed to pipe that property value to the get member commandlet, right? So there's like two things right there that were executed and I was allowed to do within the confines of my lockdown environment. What else? Okay. All right, uh, Windows PowerShell workflow. Um, yeah, workflows are not permitted uh, to my knowledge in constrained language mode. Um, yeah, we won't cover what those are now, um, but that, that has been used as a bypass in the past, which uh, Microsoft has since fixed and um, just outright not permitted workflows to be directly executed. Uh, add type commandlet. You are not allowed to call add type directly. Now, that doesn't mean that code that is otherwise permitted to execute, for example, those quote Windows system modules and UM UMCI permitted code, um, they are allowed to call add type. So. Um, from an attacker perspective, that is potentially interesting. Um, now, if you're not familiar with add type, what it allows you to do is supply a blob of C sharp. Add type will compile it and load it into your current PowerShell run space. So if you can compile and load an arbitrary unsigned .NET assembly into your PowerShell run space, then you've broken out of the um, uh, of the confines of constrained language mode. So we're gonna try to attack that at some point. Um, new object, you are only allowed to call that on a very small subset of allowed uh, .NET types. Um, let's see. Let's see. Type conversion is permitted, but only when the result is a conversion to an allowed type. Um, okay, let's see. The toString method can be called on any uh, .NET object. So that um, allowed type, like allow list, doesn't apply here. You can always call the toString method and um, I believe the get type method on everything. I could be wrong. Um, this is relevant kind of from like a, a weaponization perspective. Like let's say that you can um, call add type to load your own like arbitrary code. How would you, in, like how could you realistically interface with that code? Like you could try to call a new object on like a new uh, class that you defined, right? But the new object allow list is still gonna apply. So it's gonna prevent you from doing that. So from a weaponization perspective in your C-sharp payload, assuming you could achieve that um, C-sharp injection, you might wanna consider defining a two-string method um, in your C-sharp code so that you can interface, it, interface with it easily within the confines of constrained language mode. 
and then break out of it. Okay, uh, com objects are restricted uh, to be instantiated. So you can do uh, new dash object dash com object to instantiate a com object, but only using the, th well, there's more than this actually. There's more than the three ones specified and uh, I believe James, James Forshaw has a blog post um, that covered how to abuse um, the, the com allow list, um, which I believe has been since mitigated. Um, so yeah, I, I, I can't really speak to that, but to my knowledge, that attack vector has largely been mitigated. Um, so we're not gonna dig into that in, uh, in too much depth here. Okay, so they, they list out the allowed types here. Um, this is actually not an exhaustive list of allowed types that you can call new object on. Um, at one point I posted a tweet on, there's like some reflection code you can run to list out a more exhaustive list. I never really found anything that was really too compelling though, where you could call new object on one of those allowed types um, and achieve arbitrary unsigned code execution from it. Um, there's potential research opportunities there, but um, none that I found at the time when, when I was looking at it, okay? Cool. Yeah, so James is saying, uh, yeah, they fix that mostly. I, I worry when James says Microsoft mostly fix something. <laughs> and then uh, that Matt Nelson found another way to bypass it at some point. Cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have to hit him up about that. Okay, so let's start diving in, getting hands on here. Um, so let's, let's see this thing in action here. Uh, new objects, I'm gonna create, I don't know, a new int pointer object. Well, I'm not allowed to do that because it's not a defined core type. Okay. Um, Let's see here. This will be kind of a silly little test. Um, what do I want to do here? Okay, here I've got um, I've got putty on my desktop. Why don't I attempt to read in those bytes? Method invocation is supported only on core types in this language mode. Hmm. Well, let's see. What am I allowed to do? Trying to think what some of the supported constructors are here. There we go. Um, so that was allowed. Um, it makes sense that I should be able to create strings arbitrarily in PowerShell within the confines of constraint language mode. And then if I save this to a variable, it will indeed allow me to call the toString method on it. Um, here. here's another way I can get an instance of an int pointer without calling new object on it, okay? Um, and I should be able to call the toString method on that. And I think I should be able to do this. Nope, can't even call get type on it. So if you wanted to know what the underlying uh, type of an object is that you're dealing with in constrained language mode, you just pipe it to get member. And it'll show it, show it to you right there, okay? All right. My favorite, add type. Oops. I would love to compile some arbitrary C-sharp code. 
Not allowed. Okay? Hmm. So, any ideas here? Now, I did mention that anything that calls add type that is otherwise permitted to execute is allowed to call add type. So anything that is allowed in PowerShell per policy to execute runs in a full language mode context. Okay. So from an exploitation perspective, what we would like to achieve is to uh, find signed permitted PowerShell code, which we now know runs in a full language context, that would allow us to achieve arbitrary unsigned code execution. So that, that could be the easy part, like finding PowerShell code that like say calls add type, right? But the, the hardest piece is finding, figuring out a way to supply input from constrained language mode to the full language, uh, quote, vulnerable signed PowerShell code. Okay, so in the case of add type, why don't we hunt through some PowerShell code to see what we might be able to influence and uh, break out of constrained language mode. Because um, like having, as someone who has found many constrained language mode bypasses in his time, this is getting much, much harder to one, find vulnerable code, and two, uh, effectively exploit it. The PowerShell team lately has been really good at uh, taking in these bugs, uh, paying you a bug bounty, by the way. These are, uh, um, these are serviceable, the constrained language mode is a serviceable security feature through uh, MSRC. And then fixing broad classes of weaponization primitives in PowerShell and just constantly improving the robustness of constrained language mode. So this crap is like is pretty pretty darn hard. But that doesn't mean we can't we can't try. Okay. So here's what I'd like to do from like a like a security research perspective. Why don't we seek out some PowerShell code. So I'll start by searching in C Windows System 32, uh, Windows PowerShell, come on, Windows PowerShell. And I'm gonna just recurse through this directory and I want to return anything that ends with uh, PS1, and PSM1, okay? All right, cool. So th that returns a good bit of stuff. Now, I would like to only consider PowerShell code that has the string add type in it. Okay, that shouldn't take very long. All right, so which which files came back with code that has add type in them. Um, here's another thing I could do just to validate that I would expect these things to run in a full language context is to pipe those paths to get authentic code signature. And like, if I was to validate that these are indeed um, Windows signed. And in my first stream, I believe I showed how to show that something is Windows signed is when get authentic code signature returns true for the is OS binary property. All right. So, and per the policy that we developed in earlier streams, 
anything that is Windows signed is permitted to execute with some exceptions. Um, like uh, two streams ago, we incorporated the Microsoft recommended block rules into our policy, but that did not explicitly block PowerShell.exe. Okay. And I don't even recommend outright blocking PowerShell.exe, to be honest, because I consider constrained language mode to be a robust security feature. All right, so let's go back to this list here. And uh, here, why don't we do this? Uh, pipe that to for each object and load that up. Try loading those up into the PowerShell ISE. Just so we can more quickly kind of scrub through these things. All right, so assigned access. Let's just search for add type here. Okay, so here's a call to add type. And what I would love to influence as an attacker is the definition of this type definition variable. Okay, well, where is type definition defined? Let's define just right above here. Okay. Now, how could I possibly go about influencing this? Now, one thing that uh, stands out to me when I look for these things is uh, double quoted strings, or in this case, a double quoted here string, which is just a multi line string okay um, by the nature of it being a double quoted string that means that you can have embedded expressions and variables be expanded so that is one potential way to influence um, the definition of this variable so um, I would within this this block I would here, let me, let me highlight it. And because I don't trust my eyeballs, I will search within the selection for a dollar. And it didn't find anything. So um, I would rule out um, that form of injection and just chalk this up to being a, a literal string because there's nothing in here that can be expanded dynamically with PowerShell, okay? Now, do we even need to care about that? So, let's see. Why don't we just try this as, as an example? Uh, what file are we in here? All right, assigned access. I forget, I forget the syntax for this, but We'll figure this out together. Um, there are uh, breakpoint commands. Yeah, set set ps breakpoint. All right. So where is it? You give it a line number. And you give it a script, and then. I think that's all, all I need to do. Let me look at some of the examples just as a sanity check here. Okay, so script looks like you give it like a path to a script and then the line that you wanna break on. All right, here's my thinking. What if I just set a breakpoint on line 133 and then try to redefine type definition? and then let it continue execution, okay? So why not? Let's give it a shot. Okay, so give that and the line number is 133. 
method is not supported. Okay. Mm uh, is did I do something wrong here? All right. Let's see. Let's go back to the help. This very well could be a recent constraint language mode mitigation. Okay, script. That is kind of an odd naming of it. Um, hmm. Let me pull up the full documentation here. All right, so I want a uh, script specifies an array of script files that this commandlet sets a breakpoint in. Enter the paths and file names of one or more script files. Neat, okay. Um, so it won't let me do that, but um, what about, there's a command one, sets a command breakpoint. Enter commandlet names such as get process or function names. Well, fine, all right. Well, will it let me do that? Set ps breakpoint dash command add type. Nah, damn. Um, so you at least used to be able to do this. Um, I've reported at least one bug related to setting breakpoints and getting code execution. So I'm starting to think here that um, you're just generally not allowed to set breakpoints in constrained language mode, which um, I guess I, I shouldn't be too upset about. There's just so many potential um, breakout vectors by the nature of setting breakpoints. So, cool. And I vaguely recall Lee Holmes mentioning something along the lines of breakpoints being broken, like intentionally in constrained language mode. Cool. So, hey, Champions League. Thanks for joining. Okay. Um, so, PS breakpoints isn't isn't going to cut it. So what I might suggest would be like, let's move on from this one because we have plenty of other calls to add type in other files that we might be able to influence using some other primitive. All right, so here's one. It's passed via the source variable. Now I noticed a double quoted here string so I would look for um, a dollar sign to see if anything is expanded within this blob. That's a lot of stuff. Okay. So yeah, let me just search for a dollar sign in here. Nah, there wasn't one in there. So I'm not I'm not terribly confident that I can exercise much influence over this. Um, what was the one that came up recently? I recall reporting this one a bunch of times. Let's see here. All right. So we have two calls to add type here, um, both of which are defined by program the program source variable. Oh, look at that. So we do have some quoted strings here with uh, like embedded uh, expressions, okay? And what you'll find is that they're all references to um, localized data, that, that variable. So my next question is, okay, well, Where's the localized data populated? And could I somehow influence the contents of that and inject C sharp code? Uh, 
Um, so let's search for that. Okay, so here's localized data. Um, this is like implicitly saved to a variable with this, uh, this data block. So when you define this, um, it will define a dollar localized data variable. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> here, here's the result of uh, how Microsoft fixed the injection bug that I reported. So um, they, they properly escape the localized data input um, pretty smartly so that um, any characters that you would use to, uh, to break out and inject like usable C sharp code are properly escaped as literal strings and it won't get you anything. So while yes, you can, uh, you can inject arbitrary strings. That's all that that's the best you can achieve is arbitrary literal string injection. And based on how these are used, they're only used as strings in uh, an exception being thrown. So yay for uh, for influencing the exception message that is thrown. But arbitrary unsigned code execution, unfortunately not. It was until this was reported to Microsoft and they and they fixed it. Um, so w one of the points here is that um, there's really two things at, at, at play here in trying to defeat constrained language mode. There is developing and applying a methodology to find potentially injectable primitives. And there are many of those. I'm just using add type as one of those. And then there's the challenge and methodol methodology around influencing um, what is passed to that otherwise vulnerable uh, code path. And both of those have their challenges. Primarily nowadays, the weaponization part is the most difficult. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, well, let, let me go here because I think I found a bug back in the day here as well. Uh, where's the add type? Oh, that's just a string that says add type. It was in one of these O data ones. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so this one was funny. So the primitive that I abused in this case was prior to Microsoft specifying this as having script scope, this base class definitions um, C sharp code was defined in another signed PowerShell script. And uh, it was defined as a global variable, which I guess like made sense at the time because they're like, hey, I'm gonna define the C sharp code in this one file that this other file is going to want to read and call add type on. So sure, why not go with a global variable? The thing is, is that as an attacker, I can define a global variable and set it to be a read only global variable. So what I did was I created a new global variable called base class definitions supplied my malicious C sharp code so that when the other uh, PowerShell script came around to define its legitimate C sharp code, it wasn't able to because I, the attacker, already created a read only global variable. So it just failed to define it. But then when add type came around, it called, um, it specified the type definition of the global variable that I as the attacker set, which allowed me to achieve arbitrary code execution. 
Um, now they've properly fixed that by specifying this as a uh, with a script scope, which um, uh, normally this will be loaded as a module. So um, you can use script and like module scope kind of interchangeably. Okay, um, where any any strings that are defined within the scope of that module are only accessible within that module. So even if I defined a read-only variable from the context of constrained language mode called base class definitions, this module um, or this portion of the module in this file is not going to see the base class definitions variable that I defined within my constrained language mode context. So I consider this, this bug to be fixed. Okay. All right. Let's, um, let's find some other potential injection candidates. I want to point you to, uh, a PowerShell dumpster fire <laughs> that has been around for uh, for some time. <laughs> All right, see Windows Diagnostics. This stuff, this stuff is is so bad. It's so bad. All right. Okay. Well, let's just uh, quickly scan through some of these definitions here. Um, yeah, it looks like most of these are defined by uh, strings that were previously defined. Um, one, oh, there was another one called, um, Let me let me see here. Uh, I'm gonna search within this directory for something called compile. Yeah, I think this is it. So let me open this up in the ISE. Oops, nope. Copy paste fail. Okay. Um, oh yeah, that was it. Well, it just happened to have what I was looking for and forgot the name of <laughs> import CS. All right, check this thing out. So scrolling down a little bit, it calls somewhere here, add type. Okay, yep, right here. So um, two opportunities to call add type. So if this thing is not null or empty, or in other words, if code DOM provider is not supplied, then this code path is executed, all right? Where it calls add type on source text. All right, so where's source text come from? source text hey interesting so that's populated by just calling get content on file okay so let's see source all right source text so all right it looks like i can either directly supply C-sharp code via this parameter, or I can supply an array of source code, C-sharp source code files to this thing, all right? So, like, why don't I just try to 
execute this thing directly. Okay, so how would you do that? How do we do that in PowerShell? How do we take a PowerShell script that has functions defined in it and then execute those functions? Okay. Um, well, the natural choice would be to dot source it. Oops. To just dot source that file and then run import dash cs. Okay. Uh, constraint language mode won't allow us to do that. Okay. It says to invoke this command without importing its contents, omit the dot parameter. Now, okay. Um, here's what constraint language mode will allow us to do, however. Um, uh, I'm going to copy this to. Here, I'll call it the same thing, but rename the extension to PSM1. So a PowerShell module file. Import module instead of dot sourcing it. Okay, interesting. So we didn't get an error that time. And so I should, I should be able to do that now. Hmm. Let me just confirm that I had the name right. Import dash CS. Okay. It's not found. I was expecting it to be found. All right. So why is it not finding? Well, let's scroll down to the bottom here. Um, there is a command called export module member, where in your PowerShell module file or PSM1 file, you can explicitly state what functions, aliases, commandlets, and variables you would like to expose to the end user of your module. Um, Previously, in previous versions of PowerShell, if export module member was not specified, then it would default to exporting everything. All right, and therein lied the problem. Previously, prior to Microsoft addressing this, you were able to just call import module on this um, after renaming it to PSM1, and then you could call import CS. That is no longer allowed. So in order to bypass that restriction, well, there would need to be an export, a call to export module member in here. But you would never expect to see a call to export module member in a PS1 file. Because that's really only designed to be utilized in PSM1 files. Okay. So go to Microsoft for mitigating that. So I remember at the time it was uh, Matt Nelson and I were putting our heads together on this to figure out alternative ways to um, have PowerShell expose this garbage import CS function. All right, cause like I, I call it garbage um, because it's just a wrapper for add type. That's all it does. Like all of the functionality implemented in here is just a straight up wrapper for add type, right? And add type is not supposed to be allowed to be called from a constrained language mode context. But if there's like a signed file that implements this functionality that like wraps that functionality, then that is a potential exposure for breaking out, okay? Um, so what we did was we thought, hey, there are these things called module manifest files, PSD1 files. So a PSD1 file is, it's a hash table consisting of properties that allow you to specify what 
is uh, what is to be exported from your module. So it's just, it's another way to specify what functionality is to be exposed publicly for your module. So in a PSM1 file, you can do that by calling export module member, or you can use a PSD1 file to do that. So what did we do? We created our own PSD1 file <laughs> that uh, was like a module manifest for the quote utils setup env psm1 module and just said uh, for exported functions we just set that to star so just export everything and that worked great at the time so microsoft was like all right you know what we are going to start enforcing uh code signing checks on PSD1 files, because they didn't used to do that. Um, it was just a vector that they never considered at the time to be abused. So we abused it, they fixed it, things got better. <laughs> so our next step was to be like, all right, well, why don't we look for all signed PSD1 files that just happened to have an export an exported functions property of star. <laughs> Sure enough, there are plenty of those around. So we go file a report, Microsoft fixed that as well. So um, my understanding now is that uh, you in, sign, in code that is otherwise permitted to execute per code integrity policy, um, you, cannot, um, you cannot export everything in a PSD1 file, you have to explicitly specify the individual functions that you want to export. Otherwise, if you don't feel like doing that, then you can call export module member uh, exported functions star. I believe that's still allowed. So of course, naturally, uh, another thing that uh, we did was look for signed code that had export module member star in it. And I think we maybe found one or two things um, but at that point like we we're starting to get into like kind of esoteric very application specific uh, weaponization and um, that was a really good indication to us that like Microsoft was starting to take mitigating these broad classes of bug more seriously well broad classes of um, both bug and weaponization primitive which is super cool. So um, to date, since the last time uh, I investigated this, um, using the primitive of module, what, what, what do I call this? Like m module export over exposure has largely been mitigated because this is my target. I will always have my eyes on this target. If I can somehow export this function, then I get arbitrary unsigned code execution. And Microsoft being Microsoft can't just arbitrarily uh, remove code so easily that's, uh, that's built into Windows. So this has always been around for, for ages and, uh, and it persists to this day. Hmm. They even updated the copyright on this. I, I recall this was like, this had like a copyright notice of like 2002 or something like crazy old from like the PS V1 days, if my, uh, my memory serves me correctly. Okay. So at this point, I'm not very confident that I can directly access import CS. Now, another, uh, potential route would be to ask, okay, I can't call it directly, but if it's defined somewhere, then perhaps there's something that calls it, that calls import-cs. So let's, let's check that out. Okay, uh, here we go. We have one call to it in this file here.
Okay, so here's the call to import CS. Um, so this is this is interesting. Yeah. So it's reading in a file that as an attacker we potentially control. Okay. Um, let's let's try to let's try to abuse this. All right. So what are the prerequisites to successfully abuse this? Um, for starters, okay, it, it needs to import the definition there, right? So we're going to want to bring this in. Here's, here's what I'll do. So we did that copy before. So I'm going to, is it called utils setup environment? No, it's called CL setup environment. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. Import CS is defined in utils setup environment.ps1, but this sign script dot sources CL setup environment.ps1. So I'm going to copy this to my desktop to that file. So I hope that makes sense, right? Because CL setup environment.ps1 is what this script expects the definition of import CS to live in, okay? Now what I need to do is, um, so I wanna get this script to run, but I can't just dot source it, remember. So I'm gonna copy this locally, but change the file extension to PSM1, okay? So I'm gonna take this, And we're gonna rename it to PSM1 so that we can call import module on it, which is allowed per <coughs> uh, constrained language mode. Okay. So let's do a quick sanity check to make sure that it actually calls this. Well, um, let me let me see if this actually if this thing exists. Well, let's see. So source file and source text. Um, I don't know. Here, here's what I'll do. Let me do, there, there's some nice uh, C-sharp code for you. And we'll call that what it expects here. Okay. And you know what? when you call add type, um, it like it bakes the type into your PowerShell profile and then you can't remove it. So when I'm messing around with these things, I like to start a new a new PowerShell session. Um, so that I can just exit out of it and then restart it again um, when I, when I'm testing these things. Okay, so I'll call import module on the CL underscore that one. Okay. So I'm a little surprised that I didn't get an error because I was expecting this file to be read from and it to be like, what? I don't understand like what the C sharp is. So I guess my question is like, was this class actually defined. And it appears as though it was. So, hey, hey, what's up, Lee? Lee Christensen. Uh, so he's saying if you're using the ISC, you can also open a, oh, open a new tab to get around those type issues. Yeah, I like that. Um, yeah, I just haven't really developed a workflow of like using the ISE for this stuff, um, as painful as it probably is on, on your eyeballs as I alt tab between my windows here. But yeah, that's a good call. Um, 
Yeah, so let's see. I don't know, maybe to debug this, let's, let's check this out. So we have source file and source text being defined here. All right, so how does the code actually handle that? Um, I don't, I, I actually don't really understand this logic. If it's less than a string with a single quote in it, or uh, a single space. All right, so source text equals, what was that? Source text equals, well, we'll just call this blah for now. So source text less than that would be false. Oh, okay. So I, I guess I would interpret this at, as uh, if source text is not defined, then pull in the source file. Um, so that's potentially problematic. Is there any other opportunity for a source file to be specified here? Mm, that's not related to code execution. That's not related to code execution. Oh. Boo. Okay. Yeah, now I, now I recall why. Uh, way back when I found this to not be exploitable. So for whatever reason, when they call import CS, they supply a source file and the source text. But based on their stupid logic, like if source text is supplied, then source file is ignored. Boo. And I don't think there's any opportunity within here to inject. Yeah, I'm not seeing any, <clears throat> any dollar signs. Man, I had some real hope there for a second. Now my hope has been, has been shattered. That's too bad. Hmm. I'm just, uh, thinking through alternatives here. Yeah, that's really, really unfortunate. And this was the only signed code that I'm aware of that calls import CS. So Microsoft, you got lucky this time. Lucky this time. Let me just look at this one more time. So source file, I was searching to see if there are any other references where source file was used as an input to add type outside of this if block. Okay. Um, let's see, source text. Okay, yeah, so, so, yeah. It only references for the C-sharp code here and here, uh, source text. Cause like, that's what I want to influence. And source text is supplied either directly via the argument being passed in, or if it's not defined, then the file is read in. So, <sighs> no fun. Unless anyone has any, any brilliant ideas here, I think I'm gonna move on. I'll leave those files up though, if anyone has a, a eureka moment. All right, let's, so let's go back to the scan that we did. Uh, 
Yeah, this one. Results dot path. Okay. Um, I'm gonna open this one up because my recollection is there was something interesting in here the last time I looked at it. And really like th this process involves like manually scanning through all these things to identify whether or not um, the bypass primitive can actually be influenced from a constrained language mode context. So um, there's probably some automation that could be performed, but uh, like for, for finding these things, but I, I find it's easiest just to use, use your eyeballs. Yes, thank you, Lee. Uh, sh shout out to Lee Holmes's um, Injection Hunter module which you can get from the PowerShell gallery. So this is a, a like a plugin for the PowerShell script analyzer. And you can run this over all your code or all the built-in like window sign code. And it will automate finding potential like potentially vulnerable primitives I, I i suspect this will fail since i'm enforcing code integrity i'll be surprised if that works um but anyway so this um this will automate the process of hunting for potentially injectable primitives. Yeah, that, I, I'm assuming this is failing um, due to constrained or due to code integrity enforcement. So it, it, it will find those primitives, but it's still ultimately up to you um, to determine uh, whether or not the output is a false positive or in other words, like if it's actually exploitable. Um, so it, it has built in within it many more tests, one of which is searching for calls to add type. So yeah, thanks for that reminder, Lee. I, I appreciate that. Okay. Um, what was that one that I wanted to find? Maybe it was speech. All right, you know what? I'm just gonna skip ahead here. We're gonna do this. I'm gonna jump right to the uh, the potential vulnerability, if I can just find this file. Okay, is it this one? Am I in speech? Okay, let me search for EMD. Yep, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> here we go. All right, let's, uh, let's think this through here. So we have a call to add type with a double quoted here string. Again, a uh, here string is a multi-line string. It being double quoted means that you can have um, variables or sub expressions be expanded within it. And so here we, we do have uh, embedded variables in it. The variables in this case being um, coming from the env or environment variable ps drive. So the question is, can we influence that? 
right. So let's uh, let's play with this a little bit. So I'm I'm gonna want to invoke this, like execute this code. So how do we do this? It's currently a PS1, so I'm gonna want to copy it and uh, rename its extension to PSM1. So I can call it import module on it. Um, that was this one. Okay. And we'll just call this foo.psm1. It shouldn't matter. All right, now, when I do this, as a sanity check before we try to inject anything, um, I just want to confirm that upon importing this module that the audio config manager type will be defined. it doesn't it does not appear to be defined currently um, yeah all right so upon calling import module foo that's okay wait what happened see how you What did I do here? Okay. Um. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know why tab completion wasn't working. But um, yeah, it was indeed defined. Let me try this one more time. Okay, so before, not defined. After, defined. Okay, cool. So confirmation that add type was executed. Hope we can all agree on that. All right, let me start a new PowerShell session. And let's start playing with this here. Okay. So, what was that set to currently? All right. Now, how do we want to break out of this thing? Why don't we, um, let's see. So we should be able to set this to what is it? Um, I don't know. Double quote, right paren. Bracket. Semicolon. That should be ugly enough to to break the C sharp compiler from due to injecting a uh, a syntax error. Okay. Let's confirm that that is set and call import module. Now, if like to confirm that the injection was successful, I would expect the C sharp compiler to spit out a ton of errors. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oops. So, I'm starting to get excited here. Whoa, Matt. Whoa, Matt. Calm down. Calm down. All right. Let's temper this excitement. Let's uh, let's actually figure this thing out. So, um, yeah, it looks like, yeah, that was like the, the expected uh, syntax error. Because you can see, like, I did indeed uh, successfully inject and close out this uh, <clears throat> this DLL import attribute. Now, um, the problem that remains is what about all the other junk that I don't care about that still needs to be defined? Okay. Therein lies the problem. And let me explain this to you. Okay. <clears throat> Here's what I propose. Well, 
uh, we found vulnerable code. Like, I just confirmed that we can inject arbitrary C sharp code and have the C sharp compiler compile it and load it. In fact, look, uh, let's do this again and set this to uh, something sane, right? So instead of winder, set it to C foo, okay? So I am now confident that what was compiled was injected. But does that give me like truly arbitrary unsigned code execution? I would say no. And here's where understanding how code integrity works comes into play. So uh, could I point the winder environment variable to an attacker controlled location and then just create the diagnostic system audio um, directories and drop in my own malicious DLL? The answer is no. Well, I'm, well sure, yes, I, I, I could physically do that. Um, but would, um, would PowerShell come around and try to and successfully load that DLL? The answer is no, because that image load is still subject to code integrity enforcement. All right. So yes, I can uh, inject and point the DLL import, import attribute to any uh, attacker controllable DLL, but it's not going to load because I'm enforcing code integrity. Okay, so we can rule that out. What about the case of just injecting arbitrary C sharp, right? Like I mentioned before that from a weaponization primitive, if, if like if you can exploit this, then just go create your own malicious C sharp class that implements the two string method so that you can call it um, easily. So like here, let me, let me pull up foo. Okay. And so let's, let's walk through what this injection would look like if we were to, um, try to do this successfully. So we might start by injecting like C foo blah.dll, whatever. And then we would close this out, okay? Um, and then carriage return line feed, you know, like whatever, like one of these things we would inject in just to kind of like close out the definition of the DLL import attribute that was started but needs to be finished. And then we might continue our, our injection and uh, maybe close out the class definition, right? And then create our malicious class that contains like a two string method, which executes arbitrary unsigned code, right? And then we come back and then we would start closing things out, right? Public, static, class, whatever. And then close this out with like, you know, C windows. So this is what we would inject to exploit that vulnerability in practice. <clears throat> you, uh, you close out everything up to the injection point. You inject your own malicious class 
and then you create a new class definition closing out what remained prior to the injection. In practice, that's how you do it. Okay. Um, in reality, the reason that I have not found this particular vulnerability to be exploitable <laughs> is because ENV Winder is defined multiple times. So like I can't wrap around in my brain how to inject malicious code such that it wouldn't create um, like compilation errors due to the repeating nature of the code. And I also can't wrap my brain around due to the repeating nature of the code, how to open and close everything properly. Okay. Um, I would, I, I don't recall uh, Lee, Lee Christensen, you're in here. If, you, if you've ever looked at this and tried to abuse this, um, if, if you can't do it, Lee, then um, I'm convinced it's impossible. Hey, Luke P21, so you're saying, couldn't you inject the opening multi-line comment tag at the end? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. I did try that. Um, okay, so like what would, I mean, yeah, let's, let's try it. Okay, so what would we need to achieve to do that? Let's, let's look at what we had here. Um, okay. So it's, this is always just so tricky <laughs> to, to work with. That's okay. Um, I'm gonna do this. Okay. Let's take this and then we're gonna close out the class definition and then end it with a multi-line string. Okay, does that, here, let's, for sanity's sake, let's try that. Okay. Um, you know, I would, uh, yeah, okay. So opening multi-line comment, and then what precedes that is a completed DLL import attribute that is applied to that function that I specified. And then the class definition is closed out properly. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, loop says uh, you also need to close out the namespace properly. Very good call, very good call. I like that, I like that. Okay. Luke, are you, are you comfortable with this as it's defined? With our two uh, closing braces? Everyone, let's cross our fingers. Nope. <laughs> um, okay. So we get an error. End of file found, but the closing um, comment, the closing multi-line comment was expected. Unless you got any other ideas, Luke. Um, I thought that was a, a fantastic idea that I, I recall trying way back when and, and, and failed to, uh, to properly exploit. Now, I guess one question would be, does it 
does it actually require you to close it or is this just a warning um but yeah never mind add type by default will treat all warnings as errors anyway so i'm thinking like maybe you could throw like a um um like could you possibly throw like a pragma like ignore uh statement in there um i don't know hey james forshaw if you're still around any any ideas yeah uh, okay so lee um Lee is inquiring, does a single line comment not work? All right. uh, okay. let's, let's give it a shot. So here's what I tried previously. So bear with me, I'm, I'm gonna turn this into a double quoted uh, string. I want to escape that because I'm gonna put, put something in here a little bit. In, in, in a second. Okay, so instead of the uh, multi-line comment, why not, like, let's just try a, a single line comment. Nope, no dice. And I mean, I, I, I suspect the, the reason is because by the nature of there being new lines, the single line comment isn't going to cut it um <laughs> here's where like i was getting desperate all right what if so like we had to take into consideration the the new lines right um can we somehow trick the c-sharp compiler into thinking that what follows this comment is the end of the file So for that, I might do something like this. Cast the number zero to a char. So inject a, uh, a null, a null byte. Is that possible? Uh, whoa, uh, <laughs> did, did that actually work? <laughs> uh, where's my, here. Oh. Uh, Let's see. <laughs> okay, so I injected the multi the single line comment followed by a null. It didn't error out. And I let's see. What did I, did I do things properly? So I closed out the DLL import attribute. I closed out the class definition. I closed out the namespace definition. Hmm. Live coding uh, say maybe a pragma if debug will somehow trick the compiler. Um, wouldn't that have to be like closed out somewhere? Oh, wait, let's see. And you, you, you'll have to bear with me. Um, let's see, my, my C-sharp skills are a little rusty. So is, is what is being, let's see. So if, etc. pound if debug for winder. Um, So uh, you're referring to the the if, yeah, preprocessor directive. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would be concerned that in there not being an uh, a pound end if at the end of that, that it would be problematic.
So Etsy dot H pound if debug H. I, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not entirely following here. Again, the concern being that I'm not able to supply the pound and if um, beyond what I don't control, like down here at the end of the at the end of the definition. Um, let me let me jump back to like debugging. <laughs> quote-unquote debugging why why add type did not give me a, a sea of, of errors here. So I injected the, the null byte, but it didn't appear to do anything after that. Why? Okay, so I, I I like forced it to try to call add type again by doing import module force, and what it's saying. Uh, okay, expected class. You know, what, let me just clean this all up and try again. Sure. Oh no. Oh, okay. So. For whatever reason, it didn't give me that error, but when I force it to call add type, um, it doesn't like that. So expected class delegate. Where's the actual problem here? Like that looks like it is defined properly. I'm not sure. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that. And I will leave this as an exercise to the viewer to play around with this. Um, it is absolutely vulnerable, but as to whether or not we can use it to successfully break out of constrained language mode um, is the, the question that remains. Now, if you are uh, a genius and a magician and can figure this out, I fully encourage you to report this to secure at microsoft.com that is MSRC. Again, I mentioned that uh, constrained language mode is a serviceable security boundary. So if you are able to actually um, achieve arbitrary unsigned code execution through it, like by actually getting around um, the constraints that, that we are running into here, um, please report that. And um, yeah, Microsoft will, will give you some nice credit. Um, I don't know that they would pay a bounty for this one based on my experience, um, but your, your mileage may, may vary. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to think through other primitives that I've found. Uh, one was, was this. Um, Oh, by the way, uh, see Windows Diagnostics. These are all um, Windows troubleshooting packs. So if you've ever like encountered an error and Microsoft or and, and Windows is like nice enough to allow you to click a button to try to like diagnose the issue, that's what a, uh, and the, the subsequent dialogue that, that pops open, um, all of that is PowerShell under the hood. Um, for reference and all of the all of the script files are stored in C Windows Diagnostics. 
and they they've been around since like the PowerShell v1 days is is my understanding okay um I'm gonna do select string on script lock So here's, here's another primitive I've run into that is dangerous. And that is um, the use of script locks. So where script lock can be used to, um, now you can't, let's see. Here's something you can't do, you can't cast a string to a script lock. That's not allowed. Uh, I don't believe you can even do that in full language mode. Is it because there's there's no um, uh, implicit type converter that script lock has implemented? But it does have a static method called create where you can supply the string, uh, right? So, well, that that's not allowed, um, but the primitive that I would hunt for would be any signed code that creates a script lock in that fashion. Now, I would not limit your hunting to just PowerShell code per se. Um, there are scripts that can be written to use the reflection API to interrogate .NET code, or you can just use something like DNSpy and just search here. Well, why don't we do that? <laughs> nope, we're not gonna do that because it's not permitted for policy. Uh, what I would do is you could just load um, all .NET assemblies on, on your host or anything registered in the global assembly cache, just load them all into DNSpy and then pull up the definition for the, um, the static create method, right click, go to analyze and see if there's any .NET code that calls the script block create method in this like insecure fashion. And that has been the source of bugs that I have found in the past. Um, I don't recall if I found any exploitable PowerShell script lock injection um, in like Windows sign code, but absolutely uh, .NET code that made use of, um, of this stuff, of uh, insecure uh, script lock creation. Um, the one that comes to mind is it, Windows 10 used to have built into it a utility called um, Run Script Helper. So I wrote a, a post about that a while back and um, What's funny is uh, one day Microsoft just decided to remove Run Script Helper from from the OS. Um, pretty pretty interesting. That, uh, to my knowledge, is relatively unprecedented. That they would just remove um, code from from the OS. Uh, James Forshaw, you, you you'd probably have more experience with things that uh, Microsoft might remove, but I I, I haven't seen much of it in in my days um so anyway they in this in this executable that was related to like the collection of telemetry apparently microsoft could drop uh powershell code to this um to this directory this scripts directory and then run script helper would come around and uh and consume and, and execute those those scripts in an unsafe fashion um, that was not adherent to code integrity enforcement. 
again, because it was using one of the unsafe uh, script block creation methods. Um, it's kind of hard to enforce code integrity when uh, you're simply, when you have trusted code that is just taking a string and converting it to PowerShell code. Um, I personally don't have any ideas on how you could like say, is, is this arbitrary string safe or not? Um, so anyway, um, that's pretty much all I have for the, for the content um, today. Are there any questions? Or you're thinking of questions to ask, I just kind of want to summarize this here. Um, I've been asked, I'm sure many of you have been asked at least 4 million times. I'm scared of PowerShell. I'm scared of attackers running PowerShell in my environment or attackers have ex quote unquote exploited PowerShell in my environment. Now, I always push back on that a little bit because um, I think it's important to clarify that in the scenarios that your customers are, uh, are alluding to, PowerShell was not used as the initial access vector. It was simply used in a post-exploitation scenario as the convenient way to execute arbitrary code, right? Um, Lee Holmes and Jeffrey Snover had a, had a quote during their, uh, their DerbyCon keynote a few years ago that, that I loved. Um, they said, we know you have many choices in post-exploitation languages, and we thank you for using PowerShell. <laughs> this, this alluding to all of the robust security measures that are baked into PowerShell. So we're talking about constrained language mode today, which is a very strong, robust uh, preventative control. But then there's also script lock logging, right? So if we assume breach, we should be so lucky that an attacker chose to use PowerShell to uh, attempt further compromise in, in someone's environment because of the logging, because of the strong preventative controls, right? On the flip side, if we assume compromise, we don't have defender application control or app locker being enforced. Well, then they can just drop an arbitrary unsigned executable, you know, something like .NET or something written in Go, right? It's easy enough to bypass uh, AV to not that to have it not be flagged upon uh, dropping that binary initially, right? So upon execution of that arbitrary Go binary, like, are you going to get introspection and insight? into everything that executed in it? No. So again, we should be so lucky as to an attacker using PowerShell in our relatively locked down environment if we're privileged enough to be able to enforce defender application control. But if not, that's okay. Uh, we have the pleasure of uh, script lock logging, which can be uh, explicitly turned on to log everything, but um, it's not talked about as, as much as I would like. There is built-in um, uh, script lock logging that doesn't have to be enabled. And within defined within PowerShell is a list of dirty words that if they occur anywhere in a script block, that script block is automatically logged, <clears throat> um, which is pretty awesome. Like if you go through that list of those dirty words, <clears throat> you'll find that they um, they really capture like the overwhelming majority of key terms that you'll find in malicious PowerShell code. All right. So again, <clears throat> to the question of should I block PowerShell in my environment, quote unquote, um, my recommendation is if you can work towards a solution where you're already applying policy to block other 
executable types of uh, executable code in your environment, then you already have an extremely strong mitigation against PowerShell abuse. It's like, I, I want to encourage um, those people who, who have that perfectly rational fear that PowerShell is being abused in their environment, but just to help them um, kind of pull their heads a little bit out of the sand and like really see the, the broader picture that it isn't PowerShell that's the problem. PowerShell is part of the solution to the problem, honestly, in an in, in assumed breach context. It's part of the solution because it facilitates a strong response and investigation if you have those logs. So anyway, I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll get off my, my soapbox here and um, again, just reiterate, I don't feel that blocking PowerShell <clears throat> and you, you even need to like really define what PowerShell is. Because usually the, the naive thing is like people just associate PowerShell with PowerShell.exe, but we know that's not the case. PowerShell is PowerShell, or sorry, PowerShell is system.management.automation.dll. And there's any number of executables that can <clears throat> take that as a dependency to execute arbitrary PowerShell code, whether it's things that are built in for example, um, did you know store diag.exe in system32 executes PowerShell? Probably not, but it does. And it uh, there is an abusable primitive to get, um, like when I hit enter on store diag.exe, to have it execute the malicious PowerShell of my choosing. Now, it uh, it does that in a way where constrained language mode is still honored, fortunately. Um, but, you know, 99 times out of 100, you'll, as a red teamer, you'll be in an environment where constrained language mode is not enforced. <clears throat> and so as a defender, like good luck trying to contextualize like what evil happened by someone executing C Windows System 32 store diag.exe. Obviously, th there are ways to detect that, and <clears throat> um, PowerShell logging would, would be in play here as well. Um, so that's all I got for tonight. Again, thank you for everyone joining. Um, I'm probably going to start sounding like a broken record, um, but just to reiterate, I consider my time to be valuable. Like This is my personal time. So I'm taking time out of my day to offer this up for free, but I completely acknowledge how valuable your time is. And so I'm extremely grateful that you're choosing to spend your free time with me learning this. So we're all in this together. I hope you're getting a lot of value out of this. If so, let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll keep going until I, I literally can't speak anymore every week. So again, thank you. Love you, and uh, I'll, I'll catch you all next week. Take care.